Hey, 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 what's going on? Welcome to another episode of Hanging Out with Nolan Hong. And joining me this week on the podcast is uh, some somebody that I kind of considered like one of our, our great, like, Moby Dick, like the great big whale, the big catch, someone that I've been wanting to have on. You, If you remember in episode 50, uh, Kyle and Kevin asked me, who is the one guest that I really would love to have? And I said, this man. And uh, they're like, hey, maybe we can make it happen. And here we are years later and it's finally happening. He is a musical legend here in Hawaii, uh, a, a composer, performer, kumuhula all that uh he needs no introduction but here it is the man the myth the legend robert casimero hey robert hello brother how are you doing good good how are you hey, i i didn't realize that it took me this long to to finally get together with you <laughs> uh, and and i take credit for that only because hell i didn't know how to do this zoom stuff but well, thank goodness my the young ones in halau came over and set me up you got to give them a huge thank you because uh, for the longest time, uh, this was something that I, I had wanted to do and, and credit to you. And I, I ran into you uh, about a year and a half ago at, at an event. Yeah. Um, you were so kind and gracious and said, yep, let's do this. And I was like, all right, awesome. And then I got your email and I took a long time to, to email you because I was just like, oh, I, I want to make it perfect. This is right at the pandemic, actually. And I was like, I wanted to wait uh -huh. till the pandemic passed so I could have you in person. And then as we've seen, um, the pandemic has not really passed. So exactly. I was like, hey, let's go yeah. and let's go and see if we can make this happen. And and I didn't hear from you for a while. And I was like, oh, no, Robert forgot who I was. But it turned out it's just that you didn't know how to use your computer. <laughs> You know, the thing about it, too, is that I, I kept your email and I kept looking at it, thinking to myself, Robert, you are a failure. You have <laughs> not finished answering. And, you know, I, I've been known to be a failure at times and uh, it doesn't bother me. Sometimes we can and sometimes we can't. But uh, th this one, I'm really, really happy that it worked out the way it's it's working out today. So thank you very much for being so patient. No, thank you. And, and you know, speaking of, of failure, you said that, you know, you failed in the past in uh, it's hard for me to believe that because of all of your accolades and, and all of your accomplishments. But what is uh, that kind of brings me to a question is like, what are what is something that you have uh, failed at that is like something where you're like, hey, this, you know, kind of shows you my path and my journey, because everyone looks at just your credentials and your long list of accomplishments. And it's hard to imagine that you've failed at anything. But, yeah, well, you know, you I are human, right? <laughs> Exactly. And that's, that's a great point that I am human, even though at times when I was much younger, I thought I wasn't, oh, I mean, really? I thought it was superhuman, and I and I acted like a real dick. <laughs> wow. at time, you know, uh, but the thing about it was that if you if you're fortunate enough to have enough time to, to look back at yourself and to realize that uh, you could have done so much better. And then, and then from that point on, to keep trying to do better, mm -hmm. no matter what happens, because, you know, people never forget. Uh, I was, I'm doing this thing that's coming up in, uh, on the mainland. It's, it's, it's a show of some kind. And uh, I was sent an email that said, you know, um, I want to go to the concert, but my really good friend remembers Robert from before and doesn't like him because of things that he said and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I, I just had to, to say to myself, you know, I, I did this and, um, Hopefully they'll they'll give it a chance to to see that people can try and turn things around. But I, I'm I'm not gonna um, try and uh, squash the whole idea that you know I probably did say something at mm. one time that wasn't very uh, popular at the time. But uh, that's not to say that I I think I haven't that I think I've improved though. Yeah. And, I, and I I really like who I am so much better than uh, the person that I, that I thought I was before. What do yeah. you think it was that that caused you to recognize ego. that and make ego the change? For sure. though? But as far as oh, changing, to make the change, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, you know uh, the examples of people around me for sure, people that I admired and people that uh, didn't have to, but did take the time to try and and make me a better person. And you know sometimes they tried to shove it down my throat, and I I fought back. But then there were other times where it was done in a real sincere and meaningful and caring way and um when you when you find somebody that is willing to do that for you or somebody's that's willing to do that with you or for you then uh then it i, I felt like it behooved me to pay attention mm. to uh 
to maybe try it out a little bit and uh, and to accept the fact that, well, th- there are several truths that I accept. One of them being is that nothing happens by accident, mm-hmm. that there is a purpose to that and that there is a purpose in our lives that maybe we are not aware of, but all we have to do is just say thank you and trust yeah, <clears throat> and constantly ask for help and, and say thank you. Uh, simple things that we probably learned in kindergarten. You know, there's a yeah. book that uh, that's written like that that says everything I needed to to know I learned in kindergarten. Well, that's such an amazing book, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that uh, basically, when you uh, when you're growing up and and, and you uh, are bombarded with a, a lot of what I would consider to be negative things, you begin to believe them because you hear them so often and uh, and then it becomes ingrained. And so you fight back in different ways. But, you know, once the, the biggest thing that happened for me was I finally had to face the truth of who I was, how I was, that um, that it was okay to, to, to be afraid. It was okay to feel her. Uh, and then from that build the opportunity to become a better person by not necessarily taking out frustrations, my own frustrations on other people, yeah. but just, just listening to stories to find that there, and, and then eventually you find out that there are more um, similarities, of course, than there are differences. Yeah. And, and in the end, it's just really great. Oh, sorry. I had no idea this was going to go in such a no. kind of like deep, uh, top story here, but uh, yeah. Yeah. So. That's where I am. I appreciate you opening up about that because I think that's what, I mean, that tends to be where I end up going to because, um, you know, I think we learn so much from each other and, and, and sharing these kind of deep, uh, experiences, uh, and people up until recently, I feel, um, we're very closed minded to the idea of opening up and sharing because of fear of uh, being judged or the embarrassment and whatnot. But I feel like lately people it's becoming more accepted and it's it's healing in that others start to hear like hey you know i i feel like that's something similar to me and i don't feel if if i see someone that i look up to that has gone through the similar things like it makes me feel a little more comforted to know that I, i'm not you know the only one going through it yeah and, and like i said then then we eventually find out that there are more similarities than there are yeah different and it, you know i'll tell you it's so good like to be able to 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 uh talk with you like this and to uh just just to have this opportunity i mean you know i was starstruck the first time i saw you on the stage <laughs> i was like okay so you know I, I was raised in kalihi and all my friends were were japanese or chinese there were some hawaiians but i mean the 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 Asian guys that were my neighbors, we were really, really good pals. And I really, for years, I grew up thinking I was Asian. Oh. <laughs> my mother, my mother had to, had to always, always say to me, no, you're not, you're not Japanese or you're not Chinese, you're Hawaiian. And I was like, no, I, I think somehow <laughs> you guys adopted me. because <laughs> So into that, that whole thing there. So anyway, so I was start struck by you and I have a question for you. And that question is, when did you start singing? And when did you know that you had a voice? Holy smokes, the fact that you think that I can sing is is mind-blowing because for you to ask when did I start singing I was like I sing but I guess, that's pretty awesome that you that cuz uh you know I always fantasized like when I was growing up my my whole you know fantasy in life was like to become a singer uh and yeah. but I had such a, a low self-esteem and such um I'm right there with you yeah What really? Well, when I was much younger, yeah, you know um yeah, so I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I want you to finish your thoughts because then I want to tell you about that that little okay. idea, of the voice thing. So, yeah, when did did someone say to you one day, "Hey, you, you've got a voice"? Um, not really. So, okay, so I so talking about growing up in an Asian household and you thinking that you were Chinese and such or, or Asian. Um, so I actually knew I was Asian because my mom was very like Chinese tiger mom. And so any kind of thing that I wanted to be, she, she would, instead of encouragement, it would be like questioning and doubt. <laughs> and like, uh-huh. really? Yeah. You want to yeah. sing, but you don't have a voice, <laughs> you know, things like that. So um, it wasn't until college that I, I really pursued it, like taking voice lessons and classes at, at the local community colleges and such. And were you uh, at the University of Hawaii? What was that? Were you at the University of Hawaii? I was at several different schools in Hawaii, but the, where, where I started learning, um, taking voice lessons was at Kapilani Community College. 
And who was your teacher at the time? Lina Du. So, oh, no kidding. Yeah, she was like a like a su- super huge inspiration in my life and kind of like yeah. a, a mother figure to me. And she's the one wow. who really encouraged me to pursue right. theater. Right. So not necessarily, yeah. you know, to be a singer, but she wanted me to try to get into theater and such. So um, I've never actually fully pursued the singing because I always, you know, didn't feel like of all the things that I do, the one thing that gives me the most anxiety and makes me the most nervous is singing. But it's the thing that me I too. love the most. That's so funny. Yeah, me too, for sure. How is that possible? I mean, you've done it for decades. And I was going to ask you, do you still get nervous performing? You know, I, I still, uh, every time we had to do it, uh, in the old days, when I used to uh, drink a little more than uh, <laughs> socially, um before any time before a new show and you know when we used to work in the hotels we do like at the royal hawaiian we would change shows four times a year and i was uh, always on opening night i would have to have like a bottle of champagne before i walked on the stage what you know? really yeah yeah oh, because man. i was so nervous and um then it would relax me and then i i was able to do it and then the next night i would have the half a bottle because i had already done it one time and hopefully i could do better the next night of course not, after a while that stopped and then i had to find other ways of uh, releasing that kind of anxiety but uh yeah so i, I, I understand what you're going through i always was told though like when you drink alcohol that kind of clenches up your throat like it affects your voice did that not happen for you i don't remember oh (laughs) imagine how much better your career would have been (laughs) darn what more could could i have have done yeah i could could have been a contender for sure yeah no. But, but, but uh, yeah, I, I I I wanted to tell you too that I didn't think I had a voice. I mean, I knew I had sort of a voice, but in our family, because everybody pretty much sang and played music, my older brother Rodney was the one that uh, we all considered to be the voice of the family, and mm. so consequently, I thought of myself as, you know, a, a backup singer, which was fine with me, uh, until I was uh, I went to school. Uh, you know, I'm from Kalihi, so we went to school. I went to school first at Honganji Mission. Oh, uh, from kindergarten to third grade. Yeah. And then uh, I had to be taken out because, you know, it got to be a bit expensive. And I went to public school in Kalihi. And one of my teachers there, Miss Chong, um, was said to me one day, you know, you have a voice, you should sing. And I was like, really? And she's like, yeah. So I had my first solo in like the third grade. Wow. Desta Fidelis. And, uh, and then, you know, years later, I, I would say like by in even before you were born, which would have been like in 19... 19- 69, 1970, uh, we started with the Sunday Manoa, Peter Moon, myself, and my brother Roland. Yeah. And uh, and uh, we were playing at a place called Chuck Cellar, um, which is uh, used to be on, I think it might still even be there, on Lures in Waikiki. Well, wait a second. Uh, Chuck's Cellar. So our family owned Chuck's Steakhouse, which was oh. one block away from Lures on, I think, Seaside. So yeah. we own the original Chuck Steakhouse. And no, I know know that um Chuck Seller all I know is that they um they look very similar because they had like the same logo and stuff. So Yeah, yeah. That's I always crazy. thought it was the same. And um, above us was a place called the Polynesian Palace where Don Ho was performing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so we were under there and uh one night when my brother, my older brother, the voice, came home from the service, uh he had come to see us perform and I was really, really nervous about having him there because, you know, to me, I always looked up to him as being the voice. And, uh, and then he was the one who said to me, he said, you know, uh, you have a beautiful voice and this is your time and just do it. And I, I really appreciated that because, you know, like you, he was one of the people that I, I had someone to look up to and, and that definitely was him and to get that kind of uh, reassurance and support um really helped kick my uh my butt and and make me sing better you know that so, didn't mean that i stopped partying because i kept partying <laughs> but then you know eventually you begin to realize that the, the the voice is you know this is a gift and you don't know how long you have it so you better yeah. just take as much as you can so yeah how, so that kind of how old were you when when that happened and how old how much older was he than you when that happened i was let's see so i was like 20 okay my brother at the time was he was seven years older than me so he was 27 at the time and uh 
And it took me a while. Um, you know, I mean, I still, I knew I had a voice, but I didn't really think it was that big a deal. And then I, I've told this next story before, and, and I hope you don't mind me sharing it with you now. But when we were uh, with the Sunday Manoa, we did pretty much four albums. And the third album was called the Sunday Manoa 3. And when we were in the studio, and in those days, the studio was on Young Street and it was called something Hawaii. Uh, anyway, anyway. So we were there and, and Peter and Roland were in the engineering booth and we had we had laid all the music for a song called the Queen's Jubilee. And I was uh, to sing, I was to do my singing part next and I did that and then Peter said okay we're going to play it back to you so you can hear it if you want to change anything and I I sat on the chair and and the speakers were in front of me my young life is all about speakers in front of me whether it was in a bar a dance club playing music consequently that's why I'm deaf today but anyway moving (laughs) my wife has Uh, the same problem but she she did no (laughs) performing she just stood there and listened and it (laughs) killed her hearing (laughs) yeah right so anyway, so I'm listening to this stuff, and, and um, as I'm listening to me sing back uh, with the uh, music behind it, mm-hmm. there was a mirror to the right-hand side of me, and I, I just happened to glance over, and the realization that really struck me at that moment was that I was looking at the person in the mirror who didn't, to me, didn't match with the voice that I was hearing oh. in my ears, and I, I couldn't understand how that could, how that beautiful be- voice be coming from the person that I was looking at. And that's when, for me, that was my epiphany in realizing that this was a gift, that I had to take care of it, that I was lucky to have it for this little while. And wow. uh, and the other thing that came along with that eventually was the understanding that we may think that we choose our careers, mm-hmm. but sometimes it's the career that chooses us. And in return, we then have an obligation to it. Yeah. More it has to us and and that's the key is that if you embrace that you know that gift versus some who resist it and then that's why sometimes it's so hard because the things that they're trying to to chase instead are so difficult yeah. because that's not what they were supposed to do right yeah and you know it, it, everything's changed so much not only because of covid but because of life and technology and and things and you know for someone like you know we sing you and i we sing no, no, no matter what, what platform or, or level we sing. And so for myself, I have always prided myself on make, making sure that I was on pitch and that if I couldn't sing it, then I would, I would have to do something to make sure that it sounded okay for me because people are, are wanting to hear a certain thing. Mm-hmm. And as you get older, you know, as I, no, sorry, as I get older, <laughs> what happens is that, you know, I, I can hear the difference in, in my voice and what age has done to it and what wear and tear has done to it. And so, you know, I try my best to keep that going. But in the kind of world that we have now, anybody can be a singer. Mm. Anybody can sound really good because they can do that mechanically mm-hmm. for you. And as much as uh, I, I, I appreciate that, I find that very sad. Mm. because uh because it tells me you know that i guess that i am older and that i'm I'm human uh but i'm i'm fighting it all the way (laughs) well i'm right there with you because like i i've become the the that angry old person that always uh criticizes the new generation of music now i thought i'd never be that guy but now like ah this is terrible. You call this music? I'll show you music. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm gonna tell you, well, that's why I love you because <laughs> I feel the same way. And it's like, I remember when like we were starting back in the, in the early seventies and that the, uh, you know, we, we hit a lot of resistance, especially from the elders of the land, including members of, you know, close members of my family who would call us on the radio and, and, and call us out. On the radio, like, you know, what, what the hell are you guys singing? What are you doing? And you're ruining really? the music. And I'm going to call your mother. <laughs> oh, my God. Wait, so yeah. what, what was the... Because when I think of, of you and your music, it just seems like so iconic. Like, yes, th- this is like such a pivotal, um, like, stake in, in Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian music history and, and, and everything. But back at, yeah. back at that, then, you know, they didn't like it? Well, it, when when it comes to change and, and pivotal moments and things uh. like that, it's not always the easiest thing to embrace because, uh, and, you know, and that's why I think today 
uh, I can be <laughs> feel like I can be so judgmental yeah, yeah. Because, because they were that way with me. But, but, you know, if you can embrace that and, and use that to make you better, mm-hmm. then along the way, find other people who will support you. Then, uh, then, then it leads towards, well, where you and I are today. So, so, so uh, I guess it's not realistic to think that anytime soon you'll be releasing an auto-tuned uh, album with a <laughs> heavy. I'm going to try my darndest. <laughs> you know, the thing about it is, I've I've just I've been in the studio recently working on a new um, project, uh-huh. and uh, I, I wrote songs during the pandemic, and uh, so I have I think I have 12 songs altogether. Most of them are in Hawaiian, but some are in English too because, uh, well. English is my first language, and, and and I've always prided myself on being able to speak English well. <laughs> you know, years ago, I did a commercial. I did an uh, a internet, no, sorry, a national commercial for United Airlines. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were online with the guy from Chicago, and I was reading the, the lines for the commercial, and he stopped me, and he said, you know, uh, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Honolulu. He goes, uh, no, 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 where were you raised? And I said, in Honolulu. And he's like, you you don't sound like you're from Honolulu. I was like, bro, you like me talk to you now. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but yeah, so so anyway, so the songs are both in Hawaiian and English. And what I find is that uh, I'm working really hard to make sure that the voice comes off uh, in a way that I will be happy with and, and, and be happy in sharing that because uh, otherwise, I don't know what I'm going to do, you know? We all <laughs> Cross that bridge when we get there. You, you know, like you're saying that, you know, change is, is hard for people to accept and such. But I also imagine that as an artist, um, you want to challenge yourself and you uh-huh. want to be creative and such. Have you found yourself uh, in in mo- moments in your career that you wanted to try different things with your music, try different things with your voice? just because you wanted to challenge yourself, but then were worried because your fan base was like, no, that's not what I expect of you. Yeah. Well, you know, there was a time where, where I did uh, hem and haw about the whole thing. And then the one who really made me, me uh, go ahead and do it anyway was Roland hmm. because between the two of us, Roland was the one who was more definitely more contemporary. You know, he oh. loved rock and roll. He loved, um, uh, what is that called? Metal, heavy, like heavy metal. metal. He loved heavy metal and he <laughs> loved stuff like and so he would, and he loved jazz and he loved R&B and he would bring that into our music. And I would be the one that was, you know, more, more like I'd be coming from the, the Auntie Napua saying, you know, yeah. you shouldn't be doing that shit. But, <laughs> uh, but I couldn't doubt the fact that I liked what he was doing. Mm. And so when we would incorporate it in our music and it, it, it went over pretty well, it made me stronger and, uh, feel brave enough to to try some things and i've just you know I've, I've never let that stop me since then so yeah and then and then here i am that's surprising that he was a fan of heavy metal is there anything any type of music or artist that people would be surprised to hear that that you are a fan of and that you enjoy uh no i think they would pretty I, i'm pretty easy you know i'm <laughs> new age and uh a classical music and uh and I'm very, very particular about my what I like in Hawaiian music and what I don't. Uh, and and that, that's really funny to me because uh, I wonder, you know, in retrospect, whether if I was a, uh, an elder at the time when we started, whether I would have liked the Sunday Manoa or not mm, as well. Interesting. But I, I'm just really happy that I was a part of it and that um, uh, we didn't have to think about whether we liked it or not because actually we didn't know what we were doing. We're just having fun, Yeah, you know. And uh, it wasn't until later on that you find out, you know, wow, you know, (laughs) to read years later that we, Sande Mano was one of those, one of the groups or one of the people's uh, entities that were at the head of that newfound um, renaissance Mm. in in Hawaii. Yeah. And and after years of being interviewed and saying, oh, you know, we're just doing it because we're just having a really good time. It was good fun. We're with everybody drinking, eating, talking story, playing music. Uh, to have to realize that, you know, now we have to change that a little bit to, you know, it was a great honor mm. to be a part of it. And and even though we didn't, we may not have realized what we were doing to get to the point now where we can say that there is a, 
a definite um, responsibility that we have taken on with this, you know, to, to, to change the narrative yeah. that way. But to actually look at it from an, from a, an older perspective and, and to, be, uh, to learn from it still and to be grateful for it as well. But that's probably why you were so successful was that you didn't at the like it came from a source of joy and it wasn't the heavy burden of like, oh, this is a big, you know, uh, responsibility. I think at that yeah. age and that part of your career, I think that could have been crippling, right? To to have that yeah, kind of pressure, have, right? Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, th- there were painful times, mm. you know, uh, there were because, you know, there, there's lots of doubt that happens for you and then there's there's internal stuff that's going on yeah um and your life as well but i mean um you know it's, it's like i wouldn't know but i'm just gonna say I, I think it's like a woman having a baby you know mm-hmm. i mean there's all that pain there but but the minute that that child is put in your arms everything kind of like just melts away yeah you know you're a father i'll, I'll never be a father thank you jesus and buddha <laughs> but um, uh yeah so, yeah, even though the, it was it was difficult at times, the uh, the baby itself has flourished and done me proud. Yeah. And then thank goodness that you you decided to go through all of that, because uh, there's many people who would go through those difficulties and just take that as a sign like, hey, this is probably a sign that I shouldn't be doing this. But yeah. instead, yeah. you know, right. you stuck it through. Right. I know. And I think another thing that was really important, too, was that when Roland and I had a meeting years ago, that one of our very first meetings with John DeMello, we decided that, yes, it's show business, but more than anything, it's the business part that is the most important thing. Interesting. You know? not, not the show part. The show part is OK, but it's the business part. It, it has to be something that's working you know, for all of us. So, yeah, it was uh, and it still is a learning experience to this day. How do yeah. you how did you come to accept that that is what would be priority? Because I think a lot of people have that difficulty of being able to separate the two show business and business. Yeah. And of course, the the heart, the, the joy comes from the show business part, right, yeah. I would assume. So yeah. how do you how did you turn that and go, hey, no, we have to make the business be the priority? I think for me, the biggest thing I had to do was not just pretend it wasn't there. Oh, I had to accept it. Mm-hmm. And I had to find some way to make myself comfortable with it. Because if I felt that it was important enough, and I did feel like our music was important enough, mm-hmm. that uh, that I would have to put up with certain things that, that, that Roland didn't like. And, you know, I'm sure that in return, he would have to put up with things from me that he didn't like either. Mm-hmm. And uh, And then we would, you know, we talk about it and at times we wouldn't talk about it, but we always knew it was there and we would uh, still keep plodding along, yeah. you know, for the most part, it really, really was an amazing trip. Well, I know you're saying in the beginning, it was just, you know, as you're just having fun and didn't realize yeah. what, what, what it would turn out to be, but did you go into it thinking that this was a career though? That, I mean, obviously. Oh no, definitely no? not. No, really? Wow! But like I said, it was really just you know a lot of fun, and it's it's funny because when we did our very first album with the Sunday Mano, it was called Guava Jams, and mm-hmm. um, we were at Chuck Seller at the time, and you know for years we were, I shouldn't say for years. At the very beginning, we were considered like you know elevator music, huh? Or we sitting in the doctor's office, and, and it'd be just background and stuff like that. With the new album coming out, there were lines of people outside of Chuck Seller that we thought were going up to see Don Ho, <laughs> you know, and then to, to come into the restaurant and, and see that these people were waiting to come in there to have dinner, but both mainly to have cocktails and to listen to the music. It, 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 it blew our minds, you know? So, yeah. So prior to this, did you have aspirations or, or ex- expectations of what you were going to do in life, like for a career or anything? I never thought music was going to be uh, my career and I wasn't really sure what it was going to be. And and so I floundered a lot when I went to college because I wasn't really exactly sure in which direction I was going to go. Okay. I guess the biggest clue for me would have been that in the beginning of my junior year at the university here, um, I tried to uh, register uh, with classes that were already closed. <laughs> and, you know, 
I know how that is when you're a freshman mm-hmm. or, or a sophomore. But by, by the time you get to be a junior, that shit shouldn't be happening. Yeah. They should all be open by that time. And I was so <laughs> frustrated with it that I remember um, sitting in the middle in those days of Clum uh, Gym uh-huh. and, uh, and throwing my papers in the air and saying, <laughs> F this, and, and walking out. And uh, I, I was talking with Roland about it. He said, don't worry about it. He says, you know, we're going to be rich and you can buy your own university. And I thought to myself, you know what? He's right. Well, he wasn't right. <laughs> but, uh, but I never went back. And uh, it was helpful in that our career then got, became a career. Yeah. And, and it got all my, my attention. Yeah. Yeah. Did, so. did you have, um, you know, jobs and such, uh, you know, keep things going while you were pursuing music? Did you have any fun, interesting you have, kind of jobs? Nolan, you have great questions. <laughs> I mean, these are things that I, I give you credit. Brother. <laughs> um, I never had any other job. Really? Never. Wow. Roland did. He worked at the gas station. He, he uh, did papers. He worked in offices and stuff like that. Uh, my sisters, my brothers, everybody else had jobs. I did not. I just played music with my mom at the beginning. And my father, when I, sta- I, I started taking piano when I was in the third grade, evidently I was supposed to be some kind of like, I could have been like a prodigy of some kind, mm-hmm. but I wasn't very serious about it. Uh, but anyway, my father told me at a very young age that as long as I kept playing the piano, that he would pay all my bills. Wow. I know. And it's not like we were the richest family, mm-hmm. you know, uh, but we never wanted for very much. We we're kind of uh, happily, you know, situated there in Kalihi and we had a house and we had a life. And so I never worked except playing music for my mom. And then uh, eventually playing music with Roland and my other friends, Sam Cole. And then uh, along came Peter Moon and that happened, like I said, in, in 1969, I think. And the rest of it goes on from there. Amazing. So did your father have any other similar deals with any of your other siblings? Not that I know of. Were they, were they not jealous or upset? Like, hey, what's the deal? How come? I, you know, I don't know that they really thought about it. Oh. Uh, I, I don't know that I really thought about it, too, because I never... Um, I never tried to take advantage of it. Oh. I, I don't, I remember stealing change from my father's pockets when he would like go take a shower and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I don't ever remember asking him for money. I, 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 I don't think I ever did. And then I, I do remember that by the time I got to the university, so, you know, I'm, I'm 17, 18 at the time mm-hmm. and he was going to pay for, for my tuition. And I said to him, no, you're not. No, 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 you're not. I said, uh, uh, this is, it, now it's my turn. Now I will pay. I said, now what you do is you, you go buy that Cadillac or that Buick that you always wanted to get, but you never thought you could. I said, you go get that now. Well, you know, because, you know, you know how, well, you're a father. You want to leave something for the kids. Yeah. You know, and, stuff. and I said to him, no, nope. I said, no, you don't have to leave nothing. I said, you gave us all already. Go, go buy your car. Go do what you want. Because, because you deserve it. And I'm going to, you know, take care of it myself. So when I got my apartment here, uh, he called me one day and he said, okay, we're going to go shopping. And I was, no, for my father to say we're going to go shopping uh, was, I never, ever thought I'd hear my father say that. We're going to go shopping. Except, of course, we're, we're going to go to the grocery store. Right, right. We're shopping. And he bought the furniture for my house. Wow. And, and I said to him, why are you doing this? You know, I said, Daddy, you don't have to do this. He says, I know. He says, but this is it. After this, then you're on your own. And so uh, the furniture that I had when I first moved in here, which, of course, is now long gone, uh, because that was like 25 years ago. uh, He bought all my furniture. I don't even know if my brothers and sisters know this, so I hope they don't hear (laughs) it. I was going to say. (laughs) (laughs) Did he ever get the, the car he wanted, though? Uh, he did get a car, but you know what happened? It was interesting because then my father went into this jewelry mode huh. and he started buying jewelry. And uh, so Roland and I 
we got rings from him and uh and he bought himself a chain and stuff like that he um but but uh, yeah I, I i think that in the end he was proud of who we were mm-hmm. and he was i think he was happy i think he would have liked to my, my father lived into his 80s wow yeah. so uh which for hawaiian is pretty good because you know with all the problems that we have um uh, but he, he was pretty good. And my mother died even after him. Um, I mean, uh, uh, she lived even longer than he did. But uh, yeah, so anyway. So he got to see you and your brother in, in kind of... Oh, yeah, most definitely. That's both awesome. he and my mom. And we both, you know, it, we did uh, 30 years of concerts at the Waikiki Shell mm-hmm. uh, for May Day. And they were both our guests on stage with us. And then when we were at the Royal, uh, my mom my mom passed first. Uh, but uh, when we were at the Royal, my dad was our guest one one or two weeks in a row, and uh, and he had the best time. And actually, he he didn't want to give it up, but I made him give it up. I was like, "Listen, you had your time, old man. Take a step back. <laughs> give me back my stage." You know. So, uh, yeah. So they they were both. We were lucky enough that they were able to see. Uh, the fruition of all the hard work that they had done and that we had done. That's great. And you said your mom was a, a musician. Was your dad also a, a performer? Yeah, they were both musicians. Yeah. And so they played music. My mom had a little band uh, and my father, when he was in uh, high school, he and his brothers had a big band where they all played like saxophones and uh, uh, horns and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And they, they would travel Hawaii Island and, uh, you know, do like, proms and parties and stuff like that then when he moved to Honolulu my mom and he they had their band which we eventually became a part of and and learned to play all that's the come we learned to play all kinds of music you know dance music and and the the pop songs of the 40s those uh iconic songs Mm -hmm. that are truly beautiful yeah and and how long did uh he perform until like was he still performing we we went until we became part of the Sunday Manoa actually And then um, the, my, my mom had um, some physical problems. And so things began to change that way for both of them as they got older. And then so they were able to enjoy our our success, which became all of our success. That's yeah. awesome. So, I, yeah. of course, you mentioned Rodney and Roland. What uh, you said, and you had other brothers and sisters, too. How, yeah, how so big was I, your family? I, of the 12 of us, the 12, 12 kids. Oh my God. Of the 12 of us, I'm number 10. Wow. So Roland was number 12 because he and my sister Kanoi are twins. So of the 12 of us now, only four are left. My sister Kanoi, myself, my brother Roy that lives on the mainland, and then my brother uh, Lionel that lives in Waimanalo with his wife Alicia. And did all of your siblings at one point in time like, get into music as well or were was no okay. well, music became just just a pastime and like things to do at parties mm-hmm. and stuff like that but all the boys sang and pretty much the girls danced but you know then along came we last four and then we just took it by storm <laughs> what was it i can't imagine because oh my mom was uh one of five which i thought was a lot i must i'm an only child so i can't even imagine sure. 12 what is it like living with growing up with 12 you know, by the siblings. time we were growing up most of them had moved away because you know they they went they had their own lives but when we had parties we definitely always all got together but because my mom and dad worked every night playing music my dad also worked for the navy at pearl harbor uh we were cared for by our three older sisters so each of us had a second mother in that sister mm. and so uh in that way we all you know became even closer and uh yeah, so we were a pretty tight knit kind of like musical type family. It's like you know. the Hawaiian partridge family. <laughs> the Hawaiian, yeah, except they all never toured together, yeah. which would have been disastrous. <laughs> because because we have this hierarchy in our that we've always had from the time we we're growing up, where if the parents weren't there, the oldest sibling would become the person in charge. Uh-huh. You know, so we were always with that and then um so like uh even like right now i have two brothers above me so if if they were to call me now and say we need to talk to you right now i'd have to get off this and go there wow 
I you know they don't call. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but then if um, if I called, I, if I needed to talk to my sister, I would call her, and whatever she was doing, if I needed her, she'd have to drop that income to me because that's just just the way we were raised. So even when you were at the height of your success, and and as you're mentioning, kind of like your ego was 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 pretty large. Was yeah. was your were your siblings still able to keep you in check? Or was that absolutely possible? oh wow absolutely because if if I knew that if I didn't yeah uh, they would have no problem beating the shit out of me <laughs> yeah. so uh, and that's one of the things about not being an only child yeah <laughs> <laughs> you're a lot tougher than me because I <laughs> if I have had a problem I just tell myself <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I like that self very much. <laughs> That is going back to when you were mentioning that you, you know, remembered seeing me on stage and stuff. I, I wanted to take this time to thank you because um, the first time that I met you, I'm sure you don't remember this, but uh, I went to dinner at Chai's with a, a female friend of mine who is who oh. was pretty successful in performing in her in her own right. But I remember we were watching you play and listen, listening to you play music and and you came around and in, uh, in between sets and were you know meeting with and mingling with the guests and you walked up to us and I I remember in my head thinking I feel like Robert Casimiro is looking at me but why would he even look my way and then you walked up to me and you said I just want you to know I know who you are and I'm a fan and I was just like oh what and it, and she just looked at me with her jaw dropped and then you walked away and she was like. That was amazing. And I, from that day on, I was like so impressive to her. <laughs> so thank you for making me seem bigger of a big deal than I actually oh, am. <laughs> I thought you were going to say something like I said to you. I I, re- I remember you, my prince, or something like that. <laughs> you said that the second time I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did, didn't I? I remember saying that. Yeah, they, I remember you from that. And then there, there was another kid that I met one time who was a prince as well. And I just was a. You know, I'm impressed by anybody who can get on a stage, act, and then be able to sing. Because I've always, I, I wanted to do that, but I don't think that I look like what a prince should look like. It, you know, so. it's not about looking the part; it's just being the part. And and that's funny that you say it because I I look at someone like you, and I am so envious because of your stage presence. Like when I've oh. seen you perform, it's just it's like. You are you, and you're so comfortable being there. But it also seems so polished, and 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 it just looks like you just carry yourself with the the utmost of confidence. And I was just like, oh, to feel that way would just be like a dream for me. You know, it's it's such a struggle yeah. for me to to feel confident and and be on stage and to hear you. Meanwhile, says, backstage, there's a bottle of prosecco yeah. going at it. <laughs> hey. Do you have like a, a ritual? I mean nowadays maybe not not back then which was the bottle um, but do you have like a ritual that you feel like you gotta go through this routine? i just do warm-ups now oh, okay I, I don't i don't do the liquor thing so much anymore uh, and if i do it's probably just one glass but uh but not not for performances uh, uh i'm i i still get nervous though uh, and i try and what are you be nervous more... of like what what makes you nervous? Oh, all kinds of things all kinds of things like like making a mistake uh, forgetting something and I've done all these already so making a mistake like forgetting my words <laughs> so like you know I do these gigs on full moon nights at Chai's uh, right down here on Kapi'olani and I'll be playing and uh, I'll be singing a song and all of a sudden the words will just go out of my head you know <laughs> and uh, and then I'll just stop and people are you know they're usually they eat but lately Damn it! These people come in, they eat fast, and then they want to listen, you know. So I have to practically oh, no. do it. So when I make a mistake, I, I look out at the people, and they're looking at me, and I'm like, "Oh, senior moment," you know. <laughs> and then I'll just, you know, I'll just change the song list. So yes, I have forgotten words. I have forgotten where I was in stories. I have forgotten to call the dancers out at a certain point. You know, I, I worry that it's not going to be the experience that I want for the people that are paying money to come mm-hmm. and see me. I'm, I worry that it's not going to be the experience that I want to have by being with them uh, at that time. So, but usually, and I say usually uh, with, with a grain of salt, when the lights turned on and I can't see anyone, 
then it's better if I can't see them. And, and then I, I can, I, it's easier to pretend that it's just me. Yeah. And, and then there are other times when, I don't know if you've ever experienced this on stage, but um, I used to, uh, I used to play games with myself where um, I would look for the, the light that was farthest away from the stage. And I would sing to that light all the way back there at the, at the back of whatever place it was. And I would pretend that there were people in that light that I couldn't see on this particular dimension, but I knew were listening to me over there. And I would sing to them. And then sometimes I would have what I, I would call like an out of body experience and uh, I used to love moments like that because I was the most vulnerable on stage at that time. Mm. I, I was more than an open book. And it, I was so, to be that vulnerable and to not, almost not care about whatever happens uh, was a freedom that uh, I allowed myself to happen. It didn't happen very often, but when it did, I considered it a, a real gift. Is, does that vulnerability come out in your way of how you connect to your music or is it more of how you just connect with interacting with the your perception of what the audience was? It, it, it definitely, it's the music and, and usually what takes me away are the lyric of the, of, of, of the songs mm-hmm. because they'll remind me of someone or something or some place and I will have a tendency to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, I'm on Nihau. Or you know I, I'm there I'm back again in in Rome or especially in Paris you know I love Paris so um, yeah that that is something the, what you just described is something that that uh, I would I would love to experience because I in in the the minimal experiences I've had of of singing uh, the one thing that uh, I was always you know taught and told is like really connect with the lyrics and have it mean something to you. And that's where the performance yeah. comes out. Right. And, and I've never been able to, to do that. And it's, I think it's because um, the way I perform is just, I try to uh, emulate or impersonate, you know, what I've heard before. And yeah. so I'm just kind of like re- repeating a recording in my head of what it is. And, ah, but to, to hear how you are taken away and by the lyrics and just experiencing yeah. Man, that sounds like such an amazing connection to music that that I'm so jealous of. That I I, I only wish I could just experience it, just to know what it feels like, because it sounds amazing. You know, we had a really good friend. His name was Maynard Hoapili, and we all called him Gramps because he uh, knew all of our families, all of the young ones that hung around him. And uh, he, I remember him saying to me one time, because I would sing sometimes, and the music to me, the words would be so emotional. I would get emotional because the words were so beautiful. And although I may not have written those words, mm-hmm. I could identify with what they were saying, whether it was that elation or, or sadness or, or whatever emotion that it brought out. And sometimes I would get too emotional. And he said to me, he said, you know, the, he said, the problem with you, he used to call me Ezzy. I don't know why, but... Oh, really? <laughs> Problem, the problem with you, Ezzy, is that when you sing and you sing those words, you believe them. And I was like, well, yeah, he goes, yeah. And that's okay. He said, but now you have to sing them and you have to believe them, but you have to do that through the tears. He said, you, can't, you can do it on stage. You can have tears on stage if you want. But the more you don't do the tears, the more you will reach the hearts of the people you're singing to, because they can feel it now. And because you can't show the emotion as they sit there, mm. they can, wow. you know, and it's like, and, and so what I would do then, if we were doing, uh, we would rehearse, I would rehearse. I still do this. I rehearse. I do all my emotions in my rehearsal. I do it here by myself mm-hmm. so that when I get on stage, I can sing through the tears because I've already hopefully done it. Wow. But, you know, other times all it takes is um, to see one person in the audience yeah. that connects me to that particular lyric or song. And, you know, uh, I remember a time when Henry Capono was in the audience, we were on Hawaii Island at Kahilu theater and he had written that song pretty face for his daughter. And I was going to do it on stage and I was nervous because he was there and uh, I had seen him do that uh, song 
at his sister's funeral. Oh, wow. And I thought it was so beautiful. And that's the image that I, I mm. that suddenly came to my mind. And I couldn't sing the words. Wow. I couldn't sing them uh, uh, on stage. And so I just, I said, Henry, you, well, we, I, we call him Kapon. I said, Kapon, I'm so sorry. And so, you know what he did? He just, he just called the, the words out to me so that I could, I could sing it. Wow. Uh, and, and it was, uh, yeah, it was a really, you know, you know, we, we have moments like that. I, yeah. I will never forget that. Uh, another, it, it, I, I'm just going to share one more. I know I'm talking so much. No, no, this is uh, amazing. Thank you so much for sharing these. I had gotten a call. My really good pal was uh, Mahi Beamer. And whenever someone uh, in the family passed, they would call me and I would go and sing the family songs for them. And I remember that when I, we were, I was going to be called up to sing this one particular song. And I was thinking, the Beamer family? Robert Casimiro is going to sing a Beamer song in front of the Beamer family. I said, I, I don't, I don't think I deserve this. I, I, I just can't, you know. So anyway, so he starts the introduction and I start to sing it. And then that, you know, suddenly this, this, the, the lump in my throat was like strangling me. I, I couldn't get anything else uh, out. And I look at Mahi and, and he's looking at me like, and he's mouthing the words. And I'm like, I know the words. I just, <laughs> can't sing the damn song <laughs> and then he was like oh and then his his sister in the in in the church started to sing and then the family sang and i thought this is what i wanted to do wow. i didn't know that it was going to end up like this yeah but i mean it's, it's those kinds of moments that um uh have you know blessed my life see when i hear uh, you know stories like this and it's just so you know, amazing that you have all of these that you can keep in, in your heart and your memories. Uh -huh. um, and, but yet to know that you like, have been doing this for so long, my, my curiosity is, you know, I've not been able to hold like a job or a career for more than like a couple of years before I move on. <laughs> this, this latest thing I've done is the longest I've stayed in anything. And here you are going, you know, decades of that. Do you ever feel like, like, is there a, a particular songs where you're like, I've sung this for years. I don't want to sing this song anymore. Is like, does it still feel new and fresh to you or, or meaningful to you all the time? Every time. Yeah. Yeah. Every time. Yeah. Because I, I sing for the memories and I think I sing for the people. Wow. Yeah. And, and you know, Nolan, I love it. I just freaking love it. You know, it's so good. See, I'm so, so I'm so jealous of that because I think, you know, so many people like, you know, we just they say, like, love what you do. And to hear someone like yourself have have that and just love it. It's just like, wow, that's what yeah. you aspire for. Right. I, I've been really lucky. I mean, I, I for all these years, I've been doing a job that's not a job and that <laughs> I absolutely love to do. And then I get to talk to people about it. You know, and, and yeah, it's really cool. It's so funny that you said you've never had a job other than music. And now now I'm just racing with thoughts like, if you did have to get a job, what would it be? I can't imagine you doing exactly. anything you know, else. I've asked myself that for years. <laughs> because, you know, I also, I, I teach hula too. Uh -huh. But I don't think that I'd want to teach hula. And, and believe me, in 2025, I will we will celebrate our 50th year wow. of the Kamale. Yeah, so I've been teaching. I'll be teaching for fifty years, come twenty twenty five, and uh, I, I like like um, singing. I never thought that this was going to be a career. You know, mm -hmm. well, uh, I remember when my my teacher, you know, gave me that that kihei that we call it, uh, saying that that now I could be a teacher. I was like, I don't even know what to do with this shit. <laughs> and uh, I tried to quit three times, and she said, No, you already took the kihei. It's too late. <laughs> but yeah, so. I don't know what else I would do. You know, I, I just have no idea. When, Not at all. when you said that you tried to quit three times, w was there a point where you're like, okay, I'm going to accept this and embrace this role that, you know, I've, oh, I had no choice. Yeah. No, no, it was like, no, you said yes. <laughs> that's it. I was like, okay. Because, you know, I respected her so much too. So whatever she said, yeah, you know, yeah, I would have said, okay. Do you, so. do you find it hard, like 
to know that you're coming up on 50 years, that's so many different generations. Have you been able to see in your student, the different generations of students, a change in how you've had to teach, how they learn, different kind of cultural Definitely. changes stuff? Definitely, yeah. Uh, and then the, the change has, has varied as much as it's pretty much stay the same. Hmm. I think because I change too. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that's just par for the course. And uh, I think that every, every decade that's come along in my life, as far as Hula is concerned, they've taught me to be a better teacher and, and to be a better person, mm -hmm. period. Uh, at least I would like to believe that, you know. Uh, at the very beginnings, when I was teaching kids that were just out of high school, I mean, for years, I just wanted to kill them all. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the only way that I could, uh, I, the, I felt the only way that I could get them to do what I wanted was to, you know, to almost like be a, a parent slash policeman slash yeah. uh, something, you know, like a drill sergeant, judge yeah. Uh, slap, yeah. And uh, and then when when with the passing of time, when these fifteen year olds are now twenty something and married and have a child. You know, then, then they teach you how to become something else and, and you just change along with them. And then suddenly, after you've been doing this for 40 years, a new crop of kids come in and you have to pretty much basically start all over again from where you were at back in 1975. Wow. With new people and, and new thinking. And, uh, but you know, thank God for that history that's that's accumulated mm -hmm. in this brain and that you can you know because because what i find interesting about the young people today who are into culture and and music and and, and yeah life in general is that uh they certainly are braver than i was hmm. they they will go out and do things that i i had to think about a long time or was easily talked out of because my parents said no you can't do that Mm. Uh, on the other hand though I can I can say things to my students today that maybe they won't accept from their parents oh. and in that way hopefully solidify their relationship to their family yeah and especially to their parents more so because of what I, I've learned and and what I can give them because of the respect that they give me what are some of the things that you observe as far as dealing with this generation now that, that you've seen that if maybe older people like, you know, parents and, and people like myself, that if we understood this about this current generation, that could help bridge the gap of more understanding, acceptance, and, and help give them what they, they need to be successful and, and grow in life. I think the first thing that comes to my mind is entitlement. Mm -hmm. At times it seems like they, they want to work they don't want to work. They want to do the most minimal thing for the most maximum reward. Yeah. And, and the thing about it is that the world today can give you that. Mm. You know, it, it really can. You, you, you know how to do a program. You can be a billionaire mm -hmm. kind of an idea, you yeah, know, yeah. it doesn't work that way all the time when it comes to a, uh, a, 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 a thing like hula, you know, to become a practitioner of a culture for example, yeah. it, it's a little bit more in-depth work. And sure, you can read about how the graduation ceremony is performed, you know, but who wrote it? And did they go through it? Because we have people now who have, mm. I have. I can tell you exactly, person to person, Robert to Nolan, this is what you're going to go through. And when you go through it, you're not going to go through it alone. You're going to go through it with your family, with your parents, with your partner, with your kids, everything is going to uh, coincide with what you're going through. Everyone will go through that graduation at the same time. And that's, some, that's not the kind of thing that you can read in a book. Mm -hmm. And that's where people like you and I, as we get older, we become more important. How many kids do you have? So um, we have two boys from my wife's previous marriage, and they're 11 and 14. They? Okay. You don't even look like you should have kids that old. <laughs> well, uh, I, if it were up to me prior to, to meeting my, my wife, I wasn't planning on having any children. 
but uh, this has turned out to be the blessing that I didn't know I needed, but it's been great. And I also have two dogs. And so they, they, they're kind of my, what I imagined, uh, you know, being a parent would be like for me. <laughs> I yeah, I have no pets. Kids. I have no pet. I have a halal. That's enough. Yeah. I got it. I imagine you've got quite a bit of, uh, personalities and, and souls yeah. on your hand. <laughs> You know, it's interesting because what they've taught me too through the years is that I have I have become mother, I've become father, I've become a grandmother, I've become grandfather, I've become doctor, I've become a judge, I have become the police, and I have become professor. And pick a title, and and, and I've become that for them. And um, it's a great, interesting place to be. The the lessons never cease. Emphasis. It's so interesting. I, I, I'm so curious what maybe some of your older students might think or feel when they see how you teach now. Because oh, believe me, <laughs> they would they would give you hours of tape. <laughs> hours of tape. Well, you know, you never you you didn't do that with us, and, and you were so much cleaner then. And that, 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 that. give it a break. Yeah. <laughs> But do you did I love you though? That's the most important. Yeah, thing. you were loved. That you were important. Well, yeah, but you yelled at me a lot. I said, "There you go." <laughs> you know, and yeah. and look at where you are today. You're welcome. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and it's me. I did it for you. No, not really. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. what do you what do you prefer? Like you mentioned, like as far as when you perform, you you don't like to, uh, you know, necessarily see, you know like sometimes that makes you nervous when you see people do you yeah. like to perform since you perform in so many different venues and, and audiences do you perform like a larger audience or those smaller intimate type of shows where you can connect with your audience? You know, I've, I've always liked intimate shows i always have and consequently what i've done is i've made those huge shows where like yeah. you know the packed places and stuff like that i've made them I have created a very kind of like small cozy in the in the living room situation. Oh, with them, you know. So it so still was, feels that way. Yeah, uh, I've had people say to me, you know, why we felt like we were in your living room, or that you, you know, like, or my students will say, "Kumu, you had them in, you had them in your hand yeah. like this," and I was like. Let's put that in the heart rather than the head. Yeah. That's all a little bit odd. <laughs> like you're manipulating you know? them. <laughs> yes, yeah. Which, which in a way, I am. You know, I am. I'm, I'm manipulating them to 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 be a part of this story, hmm. to find some reason to connect to this story. That that aunt that I'm talking about, you have one too. They may not look the same, but this is what happens, and it might happen. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So. Have you ever had difficulty like um, having being able to connect with the eyes, like for whatever reason, like uh, at, at a performance where it's just like, gosh, this is one of the most difficult audiences yeah. I've had to well, deal well, with. The shittiest. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. I have. And, and what we ended up doing, you know, I don't know if this is the same thing, but I mean, one night we were at the Royal Hawaiian hotel and we were doing the show and we had four people. What? In the, the audience? Group. Yes, four. And two of them were my sisters. Oh, no. so I walked out there and I told them, get out. <laughs> They're like, what? I said, get out. If you leave, maybe these two people will leave too. <laughs> so they left. And those two damn two people stayed. So we had to do the show. And they weren't even paying attention to the show. So what we ended up doing is we did the show for ourselves. And we laughed and had so much fun. So, you know, you got to find some way to how, do it. How you. big was that room? How many people fit in there? Uh, you know, it's the Monarch Room of the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. Do you know that room, the Monarch Room? Uh, is that on the, the ground floor? Yeah, at the, by the ocean. Yeah, okay. So, oh, yeah. So the surf room is on the left-hand side where the big dining room is. Mm -hmm. And then this would be the big where you would have like a like a convention dinner or something right, like right. that. Right, right. That's where it was, yeah. And so in that whole room with the doors open overlooking Waikiki, yeah. two people. Yeah. My gosh. And were they tourists or were they local? They were tourists and they were French and they didn't speak English. Oh, so they were just there just to, I don't know, have a yeah. a, a moment for themselves. And you were just the, exactly. the so casualties. Exactly. We just made them for ourselves too. And we had a blast. Wow. Oh, your yeah. poor sisters. They 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 traveled all the way there just to get kicked out. <laughs> you know, they lived in poo poo <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, it was fine. That's so fun. Uh, 
you mentioned that you know you had uh don ho performing above you do you have any fun don ho memories yeah you know he would come downstairs in between shows <laughs> and he would be wearing his robe uh-huh and uh, uh like a bathrobe and stuff and, and you know and the t-shirt and stuff and he'd come downstairs sit at the bar have a drink wave to us <laughs> and uh yeah, so that's my my funny story about Don. That that's one of the very few. And the other thing would be like everybody knew that if you were on your way home to stop at Macaulay Chop Suey because Don would be holding cock there, and he would order. He'd sit at this table maybe with him and just one other person, but they would order enough food for like twenty people. And whoever <laughs> walked through the door, he'd say, "Come, sit down." Eat. Wow. Yeah. When I hear stories like this, it's almost like like I feel like it's like oh, these those were the golden years. Like to have yeah, that see, kind of like camaraderie and like a place to belong i I wish we like that's what i wish i had access to now i feel like it's just you don't have that really now oh i I don't i don't think it can be like that today and uh yeah and there was a camaraderie Mm -hmm. uh i just did a a talk yesterday with noi tanigao on um, hawaii public radio and we were talking about waikiki in those old days and and the fact that um everybody knew everybody Mm -hmm. we all did and eventually we would all end up at don's show either across the street at Duke Hanamoku is the international marketplace. Or when he moved to the Hilton, everybody would end up there. And, uh, you know, see the show and drink and sing and have a great time. And yeah, now most of them are gone. Mm, yeah. You know. Did you ever... Yeah, I... Go ahead. No, well, while you're going through that, I mean, as, as awesome as it sounds, that also sounds as an older person now, I feel like that's also very fatiguing. Like was it was it a hard lifestyle to because it sounds like you're up a lot and then that's also performing is exhausting too because yeah but right? we're younger yeah you know I wasn't seventy two at the time so <laughs> the idea of falling asleep by eight thirty was far from my mind <laughs> far from I mean we were going out at one o'clock in the morning you know? yeah that sounds so tiring to me right now like wow but yeah. yes to me too let me tell you <laughs> when i go to parties now i leave before the sun sets oh my gosh so oh uh, well i i i'm just i i want to be respectful of your time but i'm just having such a great time talking to you <laughs> well, and hearing all this uh, and it's a good thing that i didn't plan anything for today because this has been really great for me too oh good that means a lot to me because uh you know i I was just like, I'm sure you've told all of these stories and you've heard these questions a million times, but I don't know. I just, I just really wanted to have this conversation with you and, and ask you these questions. And, so, and I thought all the questions you asked were, I told you this, were just so right on. And, and it's almost like, I, I hope you'll ask this question and you did. And so, oh wow, yeah. So I, I'm curious about that beautiful mind of yours, Mr. Hong. <laughs> it, it's gone through a lot of, uh, ringing and <laughs> it's gone through a lot to create to get to this point yeah and and it, it couldn't have happened any better oh thank you yeah this is really really cool hey, what, it, you, what have you are you writing a play by any chance no um but i'm getting to to witness from uh the best seats in the house uh our, our dear friends Rosalind and uh kaylee rachel and uh, your former student Patrick Makuakani, as as they are putting Love together, Patrick. yeah, as they're putting together their play, um, we've been blessed with the opportunity to. That's the of, last time I saw you, right? Yeah. When they did that performance there, yeah, yeah, that was great. They are uh, asking us to kind of document the the journey yeah. through video, so um, it's been really neat just getting to be kind of like by proxy, you know, able to to witness that. Yeah, well. Keep doing it. Thank you. And, yeah. and stay, stay young because you look great, kiddo. I don't know. I'm trying the, with these kids in my my life now. Uh, I've I've seen myself age pretty rapidly. <laughs> I don't remember things like I used to as well. <laughs> I don't suppose you could give them back. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> We're fortunate. We we co-parent, so we do technically get to give them back every week, every other week. <laughs> years old. Did, are you a, an Iolani boy? No, uh, I'm unfortunately a Punahou kid. <laughs> oh, you are? You're Punahou? Yeah. What year are you? 98. I don't, I'm trying to think who I, no, oh, no, no. my classmate is a, was a, a friend of yours and he performed with you, Jeff Ahoy. Oh, yeah. yeah. No kidding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, he's a trip. <laughs> yeah. He always was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd rather perform with you to tell you the truth. Okay. <laughs> Until you okay. hear me sing and then you'll be like, uh, bring Jeff back. <laughs> you know, it's funny because, you know, I, a, a lot of people think that my halals that can sing and dance and we, you know, we're like, we can crawl on our belly like a reptile. Well, we can do all of that. Except the singing can be a challenge, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, so I do my best to cover the whole thing up. But the thing about it is for some guys who would never ever, you would never think would sing. Now they can at least carry a melody a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, without um, the so- kind of music that's out, that's popular. It's not like, I swear it's all flat and off key. But that's the style. It's like, hey, it's really. And then if you think that you're going to go off, then you do a little bit of the. uh, 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 (laughs) And I'm like, okay, (laughs) yeah. So do you ever? Because I know you, you, you said you used to party and stuff. Did you? Did you and do you ever like go like karaoke and stuff, or is that like I sing for a living? Hello, I don't need to sing anymore. All of that. Yeah, everything you just said. I've gone to sing it. I've gone to listen to people sing it. I don't know why I do it because I I do it for a living. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't go out of my way to go to karaoke anymore. Uh-huh. But in the old days, I had my favorite place to go was down here on School Street, a place called I don't know. Do you know Shinshote? Yes. It's okay. Is it still there? Yeah, it's it's it used to be right next to um, uh, Hungry Lion. Hungry Lion, yes. right? Hungry Lion now is Starbucks. Yeah. And then they have a, a sushi place next to that. And Shinsho Te is still there. And I haven't been there for a while. During the pandemic, I would go for takeout. Okay. But um, my friend Helen owns that place. And so I would go. The first time I ever went in there, uh, it was on a Monday night. And nobody was there. And just some friends and I had gone in. And that's when I met Helen. And and I I became a fan of hers and a friend of hers. And we'd sing together. And I'd go in there and sing and so if i do go to sing in there i go to sing for her and uh and then i just you know grab my pork chops and run away so so now i'm excited if you don't mind i have some questions go ahead go so when you did or do sing karaoke what songs do you sing okay i'm old okay okay i'm old these are my favorite old ones my my favorite one that i like to sing is um barry manilow's um Weekend in New England. Do you know that I one? No. Okay. I know Barry Manilow, but I don't know Last that song. Night, I said goodbye. Da, da. Anyway, it, I, I sing the shit out of that song. <laughs> and then the other one uh, that I like, and I, I would do it for Helen because and it was a baby face song. And it's wow. about, uh, I think it's called The Day. Yeah. Uh, it's something about when his child was, was, was going to be born or yeah. something like that. And I always do it for her because, you know, you know, mothers and their kids. Mm-hmm. So I, I always sing that for her. And so those are my two favorite go-tos. And I like um, Luther's uh, Love Has Surely oh Been Good. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I love that, too. So, wow. That sounded, mm-hmm. just that just that line just gave me chicken skin. I can, oh. <laughs> that sounds so <laughs> good. I can only imagine what it's like. Because when I go karaoke bars and stuff, like it's funny. You, you'll probably appreciate this, but inside, I'm I'm severely judging people. Not that I have any right to stand there and judge others' performances, but I feel like I'm very much like Simon Cowell when I'm in a karaoke bar, yeah. and I'm like, Nolan, I would be have, on your side. You have no right to sing this song, listening to you yeah. sing this way. But if I heard you sing Luther, I'd be like, everybody, stop what you're doing. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> this. This is well, gold right here. <laughs> well, the next time I, I do anything, and I don't know exactly when I'll be doing something that's here in Honolulu, I have stuff to do away, but I'll make sure I invite you. You oh, can come wow. you can bring your, your lovely with you or whoever it is you want to bring. And, and and we'll just, you know, hang. That would be amazing. I would love to sing with you, to tell you the truth. Oh, uh, I I think I wouldn't be able no, to no, say any No, no, don't put up words. any of those, those barriers. Do not put up any barriers. Uh, let me tell you a quick story then. Because okay, cool. the reason why I'm 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 so honored and excited and terrified is because um I don't know, it must have been like 10, 15 years ago, uh I was taking ukulele lessons with uh, Jake Shimobukuro and oh. I had told 
In fact, he's the one who got me to connected to Kapiolani Community College and with my teacher, Lina Du, because I'd asked him like, hey, I, I want to try and see if I can learn how to sing and, and, and such. And he's, he had suggested I go take lessons from her. Anyways, he was saying he's performing. Uh, he had a little little concert uh, at the Pagoda. Oh, no, not Pagoda. Um, what's the one in Mo'ili Ili? Ili? Um, the, the restaurant there. Uh, in Mo'ili Ili? Uh, in house on Houston Street, I think uh, they just closed. But oh, and, oh, uh, um, Chico's. No, Is no, that no. It? no. It's a, a restaurant. A um, restaurant. It's a it's a famous one, and I'm, everyone's probably yelling at me right now that I'm <laughs> not. Yeah, and look, and look at me. You're, you're giving me the name of the street, <laughs> and I still can't think of who it is. Houston Street. Houston. It, it's by like where Longs is now, like where Star Market used to be. Anyways, okay, uh, not, I don't know. Anyways, Japanese restaurant. It's a local. Like they always have. Like uh, they had a, a um, buffet dinner. I. You think about it. It's yeah, gonna yeah. Come to you. yeah. When we hang up, yeah. I'll be like, oh, what's this? Anyways, yeah. So you can text me. Yeah, <laughs> I have your number. You have mine. Okay. Number. Deal. Okay. I'm gonna go look it up probably. <laughs> but okay. um, so, so what happened? But so he's like, "Hey, I, I'm performing, and uh, why don't you come on stage and sing a song with me?" And I said, "Oh, yeah, this will be great. Like, I can put this on my, you know, resume. Like, I performed yeah. on stage with Jake Shimabukuro." And I was so nervous though. He's like, "Well, what song do you want to sing?" And I was like, "I don't know. What, what song do you want me to sing?" And he goes, "You know more than words." And I go, sure. And the problem is I didn't know that song more than words. <laughs> I just said, yeah. And so he's like, okay, this Thursday, come on over. So I had like four days to learn the song. And so and I, did just, I just played it over and over on my on my Walkman. And then when I got on stage and he starts playing the the guitar, because he, uh-huh. I, I know the song better on guitar, so he pulls up his guitar. And I go, sing them. <laughs> it's like I forgot all the words and then I freaked out and I saw all the Japanese tourists staring at me like ah <laughs> it's like, it's like, and why didn't I, you just pull out your phone I didn't this is before smartphones oh yeah oh. so and then Jake starts trying to sing the words for me and then of course because I'm so nervous now and freaked out my, my vocal cords clenched and I was just like I couldn't hit the notes and so yeah. we I we ended the song after the first uh, chorus and, and I was like, oh. all right, thanks. And I ran off the stage and I got my car and I drove home and I was like, okay, I never want to perform again. <laughs> We're going to definitely practice before I call you on stage. <laughs> Just make sure that you're okay. Cause I don't want, I don't want you to be embarrassed at all. And, I, and you know what, if that ever happened with us, I would just say, let's sing happy birthday. Yes, I can do happy birthday. I can do happy birthday. <laughs> I can harmonize with you on happy birthday. I tell you, fantastic. Yeah. All right, deal. Yeah. That that'll be our our bailout. If our if, go to song yeah. will be happy birthday. <laughs> yeah, or the uh, or the Punahou alma mater. I don't even know what that is. I'm such a bad alumni of Punahou. Are you really? Yeah, I, I never thought there were bad alumni from Punahou. No, I'm like so uh, ashamed that I went there because I'm I'm such a bad representative of oh. it. <laughs> I didn't. Stop that. I didn't uh, enjoy my time it. there. I don't know anything right, you're, about the school. <laughs> you're a great man. You just, yeah, you just keep going the way you're going and you'll be fine. So you are. Thank you. Bef- before I let you go, I have one more question about karaoke. So when you perform at karaoke bars, is it, yes. be- is, are they, do you like to do songs that you would never perform like for your shows and, and, and such? And yeah. is that when you have yeah. fun and do you ever, yes. do you ever sing in styles that, um, is not yours, or do you just Robert Casamero fi all of the songs that you cho- choose? I just, well, for the most part, I just Robert Casamero fi the whole okay. thing. <laughs> One time I was singing with um, uh, Guy Cruz, mm-hmm. and I forget what song it was, and uh, I, I don't think it started off to be a competition of any kind, and, <laughs> and I really didn't think of it as a competition, but he, he kept singing, and I kept singing, we're going back and forth, and I was having the best time, and finally he stopped singing, and he goes, Shit, I can't keep up with you. you <laughs> and I was like, no, that's that's not the point. I'm 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 like I'm 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 you know I'm getting this off of you and I'm I'm enjoying this so much. He was like, no, this is all about you. And I was like, oh damn. Because you know, you I don't always get to have that kind of give and take kind of yeah. situation. Yeah, so it was 
I, oh, I, I, I love Guy Cruz. I was really sad when he passed away. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. That's yeah. so amazing that you have like, you just pulling up these names like, oh yeah. And then this one time I was singing with so-and-so and it's just like, for you, it's like no big deal. But for me, it's like, wow, this is, this is a world that I can only fantasize about imagining exists, you know, <laughs> to be a fly on a wall. Hey, the next time something like that happens, I'll give you a call for sure. You oh. call. You, you'll be my younger sibling. Yeah. This is your older brother. I'm saying you got to get your ass over here yeah. right now. And then it, it, hopefully there's enough people in there so that you don't send me home <laughs> like your sisters. That would never happen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask you, what's your go-to song for um, karaoke? Oh, this is embarrassing. After you've rattled off those classics no, for no, me no, to go. tell you what I go to is uh shaggy's it wasn't me <laughs> it wasn't me <laughs> oh no i like that song I, i've never sung it but i like that song can you imagine we can we agree then that if if we ever do get to go to karaoke together that you will sing it wasn't me with me you can do the chorus I will. I would love to. yeah wow that would be a, such a viral moment because <laughs> uh, all i know is it wasn't me but, yeah <laughs> um but like i like uh i like old songs like you know um what is that one about superman Super. Um, uh, gee, I can't even think of how the melody goes now. It, it was from Dawson's Creek, I think, a long time ago. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, shoot. I can't think of how the melody goes right now. But, uh, oh, damn it. Anyway, I like those kinds of songs. Yeah. You know what the the mel- I'm gonna. This is another. I'm gonna call you and I'll yeah. leave it on your machine. We're gonna have a lot of back and forth of like, oh, it was this we place. Are. <laughs> yeah. We definitely are. Yeah. Uh, I, I like like something like a, between my feet. I don't know. It's it's escaped me. For I sure. just I just love that you know the legend that you are in music and the the pioneer in music that you can that I can still talk music with you and that we could talk about these kind of songs like this is so this is exactly what i had hoped for that you were this type of you know artist and and person and human being and uh it's it's been Uh, really cool keep in touch with me please mr hong uh, nothing would give me greater joy than to do that thank you for opening uh yourself to to that that would be amazing and uh i'm i'm looking forward to what's to come in the future like whether it be that we we hang out at a karaoke bar or I get to see you performing uh, at one of your shows um, or just just getting to know each other. Yeah, I know. Robert's karaoke review. We should just like get a bunch of different people that we know that are really fun in karaoke and have like our own like mini concert. That's been a fantasy of mine, honestly. But no, let's let's have people that sing worse than us. (laughs) Oh, yeah. We uh, see. That's why you're the professional. You know how to make (laughs) make it work. (laughs) <laughs> that's right so that's what, true. I hope you have a, whatever you're going to do for today i hope that it goes well thank you same to you i hope you have a blessed day and um honestly i cannot thank you enough this has been so amazing it's my pleasure and um i cannot even begin to tell you how much i enjoyed this and i was looking forward to it too and i'm sorry it took me so long it was I'm worth the it- wait Trust me. <laughs> I would have waited another 10 years for this. <laughs> no, I'd be dead by then. So I'm glad we did it now. No, oh, thank you so friend. much. You're more than welcome. You uh, take care, okay? You too. Okay, my prince. I will talk with you again soon. Thank you. Aloha. Oh, my gosh. Did that really just happen? That was amazing. Thank you so much to Robert Casimero for hanging out with us. Uh, I am at a loss for words. I That was so much fun. And uh, I, I wish I, I mean, I could see myself just uh, talking to him for, for hours and hours more. But um, that fulfilled every fantasy and expectation I ever had of him. He is such a beautiful soul, an amazing human being. Um, and the, the stories that he told is, uh, just fantastic. Um, I hope you all enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. And if you didn't, uh, that's fine with me because that was, uh, worth every dollar in the world for me. So, uh, that was, that was fantastic. If, uh, if anything, this podcast, uh, is such a blessing for me because it has allowed me opportunities like that to get to uh, interview Robert Casimiro, a true 
legend in, in Hawaiian music, in Hawaiian culture, and just a legend of a person, uh, just a beautiful soul. Thank you so much, Robert. Cannot thank you enough. And uh, I feel I, I feel silly that I didn't uh, give him a chance to plug anything, but uh, of course, um, we'll have uh, some links in the description with uh, any information on uh, where you can stay connected with him, uh, keep up with the, the projects that he has going on, and uh, where he'll be performing next. But um, yeah, nothing but thank yous and, and much, much mahalos to, to Robert. And thank you to you, the listeners, for listening. Um, if it wasn't for you listening, I would have no podcast and I would not have these amazing opportunities to uh, to get to know my heroes, uh, legends in the world. So thank you so much for continuing to support me and the podcast. Um, we'll be back next week with another episode. Stay tuned. And uh, again, feel free to uh, let me know what you thought of the episode. Uh, reach out to me uh, with any suggestions or questions. You can email me, me at nolanhong.com. That's my email address, me at nolanhong.com. And uh, other than that, have a great one. We'll see you next week on another episode of Hanging Out with Nolan Hong.